Um, we want to thank you for coming out to our annual Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's celebration. We are um, very pleased that you are supporting the NAACP Chapter 714. And we would like to, we won't be uh, labor you long, of course. I am Pat Lavroni um, with um, Carroll County Public School System. And I will be your mistress of ceremony, not master of ceremony, but mistress of ceremony. And I would like to start off with the invocation by Pastor Don Lavroni from Fairview United Methodist Church. So we're here for this auspicious occasion again to celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday. So with that said, let us pray together, please. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just come to say thank you. Thank you because you orchestrate everything in our life. Now we're here today, Lord God, to celebrate this great man and his accomplishment and what he's done for not only for the civil rights movement, but for the whole entire world. So we just say thank you, Lord. We welcome your presence. And we just pray that everything be done to your glory, to your honor, that you be edified and glorified. And we just say thank you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. At this time, I would like to introduce the head table. We have our guest speaker, the pastor Brian K. Wilson Sr. Um, with his lovely wife, Reslin, and Sharon Norris, which she is the daughter of Jean and John Lewis. Jean Lewis, who's sitting in the back giving directions. Dr. Pam Zepardino and Dr. Charles Collier. All right. So let's sit back, ready for the good um, meal that Martin's West always gives us on this special day. Thank you very much. So at this time, we're going to present the youth part of the program, where we will have various youth from Carroll County trying to enlighten you about someone important in African-American history that you may not know a lot about. So at this time, I'm going to ask for each youth to come up as I introduce them. The first one is Jordan Costling. Jordan is a sixth grader, and Jordan is involved in dance and the school musical. Let's give Jordan a hand. And next is Martise Goodwin, who is an 11th grader who participates in track at Westminster High School. We also have with us Micah Goodwin, who is a 10th grader who participates in track and, oh, I'm sorry, I said it backwards. We have Micah Goodwin, who is, no, that's right, 10th grader who cheers for Westminster High, participates in track, track and is in the um, church choir. And we also have Morgan Goodwin, who is an eighth grader at West Middle School, who does track and also participates in her church choir. And last but not least, we have Tevin Jones, who is an 11th grader that participates in basketball and soccer and lacrosse. He's just an all around. Here I am standing outside the White House during a family trip to DC. My father said, I proclaim, I will work there someday. I don't remember saying that. But my parents did have me convinced that even if I could not, couldn't have a hamburger at Woolsworth counter, I could grow up to become president of the United States. Who am I? This morning, we will be learning about Condoleezza Rice. We want to see how much you know about this pioneering African-American woman. The excerpts read will be from her book, A Memoir of My Family's Extraordinary Ordinary People. There will be 10 questions and a few prizes. Let's begin. When was she born? A, 1953, B, 1954, or C, 1955? The answer is B, 1954. 
Where did she spend her early life? A, Denver, B, Tuscaloosa, or C, Birmingham? All right, the answer is C, Birmingham. Because Birmingham was so segregated, black parents were able, in large part, to control the environment in which they raised their children. The extended family provided the first layer of support. Our little neighborhood of Titusville provided a strong network of black professionals who were determined to prepare their kids for productive lives. The schools were completely segregated in Birmingham. Teachers were dedicated. Teachers had high expectations and were pretty tough on low performers. To succeed, you will have to be twice as good, they routinely told us. The church provided a final layer of support. Whatever feelings of insecurity or inadequacy black adults felt in Jim Crow Birmingham, they did not transfer it to us. In Titusville, the message was clear. We love you and we will give you everything we can to help you succeed, but there are no excuses and there is no place for victims. Thank you. Her parents were A, a minister and a teacher, B, a teacher and a doctor, or C, a minister and a homemaker. The answer is A, a minister and a teacher. Mother taught English. She was a stickler for good grammar. She was the coach of the debate team and would enter her students in a citywide oratorical contest. She also directed student plays and musicals. Mother taught American baseball legend Willie Mays. He recently told me that he remembered her well and recalled that she told him early on, you're going to be a ball player. If you need to leave a little early for practice, you let me know. Daddy formed a, teen, formed a club for teenage boys called the Cavaliers. Daddy involved several other men from the church and the community. There were panel discussions, tutoring sessions, and a one-week summer leadership conference at Stillman High. He would insist on strong academic performance and counsel each student towards college. Daddy's kids turned out to be a remarkable lot. For example, Freeman Rabowski III lived at the corner of our street. My father called him his little math genius. Freeman went to college at 15, received a PhD in higher education administration, and now serves as president of UMBC. Rice is an accomplished A, celloist, B, pianist, or C, violinist. The answer is B, pianist. Thank you. I was three years old when Grandmother Ray asked my mother if she could start giving me piano lessons. I love the piano. My parents had brought a little electric organ for the new house, and I play it for hours. A problem emerged as I began to play hymns. The little organ didn't have enough keys. I needed a piano, I told my parents, several months into my piano lessons. My daddy made me a deal. When you can play what a friend we have in Jesus perfectly, we will buy you a piano. The next day, I went to my grandmother's house and sat at the piano for eight hours, not even wanting to break for lunch. When my parents came back to pick me up, I played with a friend perfectly, as they did many times in my life. John and Angelina did not disappoint. They didn't have enough money to buy a piano, but they rented one the next day. Rice's father was A, a Democrat, B, a Republican, or C, independent. The answer is B, Republican. Another oft-told story relates to my father's decision to become a Republican. Daddy and mother went to register to vote one day in 1952. Back then, Southern officials frequently used poll tests as a way to discourage black people from voting. Mother sailed through the poll test after the clerk said to the pretty, light-skinned Angelina, you surely know who the first president of the United States was, don't you? Yes, mother answered, George Washington 
But when my dark-skinned father stepped forward, the clerk pointed at the container of hundreds of beans. How many beans are in this jar? The f and how many beans are in this jar, he asked father. My daddy was devastated and related his experience to an elder at his church, Mr. Frank Hunter. The old man told him not to worry. There's one clerk down there who is Republican and is trying to build a party. She'll register anybody who'll say they're Republican. Daddy went down there, found the woman, and successfully registered. The rest of his life, he was a faithful member of the Republican Party. Thank you. She earned her bachelor's, her bachelor's and master's degrees from A, University of Denver and Stillman College, B, University of Denver and Stanford University, or C, University of Denver and University of Notre Dame. The, the correct answer is C, University of Denver and University of Notre Dame. After deciding to abandon my dream of being a concert pianist, I wandered into a course in international politics taught by Joseph Corbell. In one of those odd coincidences, the man who opened up the world to Soviet studies to me was the father of Madeleine Albright. I received my PhD in international studies in 1981 from the University of Denver with a job from Stanford in hand. In 1993, Rice became the first woman and first African American to A, serve as director of Soviet and Eastern Europe, East Europe, European Affairs with the National Security Council, B, serve as provost of Stanford University, the university's chief budget and academic officer, or C, serve as international affairs fellow attached to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. The correct answer is B, serve as provost of Stanford University, the university's chief budget and academic officer. Rice is an avid football fan. Her favorite team is A, the San Francisco 49ers, B, the Cleveland Browns, or C, the Washington Redskins? The correct answer is B, the Cleveland Browns. In 2001, Rice became A, the National Security Advisor by President George W. Bush, becoming the first black woman and second woman to hold the post, B, the first, woman, the first black woman to serve as the U.S. Secretary of State, or C, one of the first two women to become former to become members of the Augusta National Golf Club located in Augusta, Georgia. The correct answer is A, the National Security Advisor by President George W. Bush becoming the first black woman and second woman to hold the post. All right, thank you. She became the first black woman to serve as Secretary of State in 2004, following Colin Powell's resignation and served from January 2005 to 2009. Condoleezza Rice currently, A, directs the Global Center for Business and Economy. B, is a professor of political economy in the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University, or C, all of the above. The answer is C, all of the above. In her final comments in her book, Condoleezza Rice wrote, I could almost see John and Angelina Rice at the door of my West Wing office as National Security Advisor and hovering over me as I flew into combat zone in Baghdad as Secretary of State. You are well prepared for whatever is ahead of you, I could hear them say. Now don't forget that, God, that you are God's child and he will keep you in his care. They remain by my side. We hope you have learned something about this extraordinary woman and the roots given to her by her family, church, and community so she could fly into groundbreaking new heights for African Americans. Thank you. 
Okay, well, thank you all for your participation in getting to know a little bit more about Condoleezza Rice. And at this time, I will turn it back over to Mrs. Patricia Lebroni. Thank you. Um, before we get into our guest speaker for today, I would like to um, bring you some highlights of the activities of the NAACP uh, Chapter 7014. If you take a look in your insert, you'll see a list of upcoming events. We like for you to place those on your calendar, if you will. I do want to bring your attention to the Carroll County Board of Election. They are interested in um, election judges. If you're interested, please call Katie Barry. The number is 410-386-2598. Again, the number is 410 3862598. I also would like to call your attention to the pamphlets and cards on your table. Um, one with um, quitting smoking and cancer. We like for the public to start spreading the word about um, smoking restitution. Um, it's with the health department, and um, we would like for our community members to really make a strong effort in stop smoking. So please take the pamphlet with you as we leave today. Our guest speaker for this morning is Pastor Brian Keith Wilson, Sr. He is safe. Oh, let's give him a hand, okay. He is saved by the Holy Spirit. He said that this is the best gift that he has received. Pastor Wilson heard the call to preach in June 1993 while on a honeymoon with his wife, Minister Reslin Wilson. In June 1995, he became an apprentice minister through the Church of the Living God in Harrisburg, his native Pennsylvania town. Later, Pastor Wilson pursued his ministerial license through the Church of the Living God and began assisting his father, Pastor Jerome Wilson Sr., as a junior pastor at Way of the Cross in Harrisburg. While Pastor Wilson maintained his passion for preaching, he could not ignore his vocation as a special education teacher through the Harrisburg City Schools. After three years of service to the Harrisburg City Schools, he relocated to Baltimore, Maryland, and was brave enough, no, I'm only joking. He, <laughs> he, was, I mean, he um, relocated to Baltimore, Maryland, and accepted a special education teacher position through Baltimore City Public Schools. In 2003, by God's leading, he found Praise Place Church of the Living God and later merged his church with Flat Rock Church in the Baltimore area. After serving at Flat Rock Church, he served as the Church of the Redeemed of the Lord in Baltimore, Maryland. Nine years where he served continued um, as associate minister. Pastor Wilson has a bachelor's degree in journalism and has continued his studies on the graduate level through Lancaster Theological Seminary and Chesapeake Bible College. Pastor Wilson has relaunched a church January the 5th, 2014, called Refreshing Times Church and Ministry in Windsor Mill, Maryland. While currently he is a management representative at Blue Cross Blue Shield, he is most passionate about leading his household, his wife and four children, down a path of holiness. He declares in his heart that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will have a rendition by A.J. Wilson Gospel Singers, and the next voice you will hear will be Pastor Brian Keith Wilson, Jr. We can make it together if we try. Then 
black and white will turn out right together. You take Jesus as your Savior and you let him I know we can make it. We can make it together. And I know we can make it. We can make it together. And I know, I know we can make it. We can make it together. And I know we can make it. Together with love. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> I know it's early, and I hope I can wake you up a little bit. I um, I feel like I should be nervous, and I'm not. I'm not nervous right now, and that makes me nervous. <laughs> um, you know, and I brought my. Big Bible, but it doesn't mean I'm super spiritual. <laughs> it just means that I, I need to be able to see. This is my large print Bible today. I thank God for this opportunity. Um, it certainly doesn't come every day. My mother told me a while ago that, Brian, um, God is going to put you before great men. And I thought, when is this going to happen? <laughs> so uh, it looks like today's the day. Um, and I just want to say thank you um, to President Gene Lewis for inviting me. Um, and I know this takes a lot of work. It's not, it's not easy. It looks, you come in and you, you eat the food and you see the programs before you and, and you see the smiling faces, but there's a lot of work that goes into this. So let's just give them a hand for their uh, sacrifice. <laughs> and that's the Cal County um, NAACP branch. Zero, I'm mean, seven zero one four, and the executive committee. I want to honor you as well, and all of the officers. I'm not going to be before you long. Someone made a comment at the table. Uh, are we going to have to pull some strings? <laughs> and uh, I don't consider myself to be long-winded, um, but I do want to share um, what was given to me. And um, I think I, what I want to do is encourage you to walk in the light. And I saw these these young people come forth. And it's not easy standing in front of people. And if you really watch them, you could see some boldness. And I think that's why I'm not so nervous right now, because they encouraged me that it's not easy standing in front of people. And I just want to tell you all to just continue to walk in the light. Even in darkness, um, there is light. And I, th I hope you find that out um, once we go through this my message. I'm just going to read briefly Genesis, the first chapter. Um, but before I do that, I'll say a little prayer. God, I thank you for this opportunity uh, to come before your people. I sense that this is a room full of high achievers. And so I pray that um, I would meet first your expectation. And in doing that, that I meet theirs as well and that you send a word to them that will stay with them, that they can use um, in the practice of, of their jobs and, and in just living uh, as heads of households and um, parents and children. And I ask, Lord, that uh, you would just show them the light as we move forward, Lord, in the message, and we'll be careful to give your name praise. Amen. How many know what... Um, the first, cha first chapter in the first verse of Genesis says. I'm sure I have some people who know that. I'm going to read it. Don't get nervous. But um, this is really, really, uh, uh, this is a popular verse. Um, in the beginning, does that help some? In, in the beginning, God did what? Created the heaven and the earth. And then the second verse says, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of, of the deep. There's some scholars in here. 
And, and the Spirit of God did what? Moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light. He saw his own light that he made. And he said that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called light day. And darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And there's plenty more to read there, but I, I think I'll stop. Um, and my thought today is to walk in the light. And we have so many different changes in our society. Um, and we see darkness and light all around us. So certainly I don't have to get into explaining to you what light and dark is. Society today is experiencing a drastic downgrade in the moral standard. It is devalued more and more with each presidential election. Like it or not, the way many perceive godly standards is hugely influenced by the moral standard, when in fact it should be the other way around. And it seems to be more and more difficult for people to really, really discern light from dark. And that kind of um, perplexes me. It is quite concerning how people can reason that light is the same as dark. When in John, the first chapter, verses four through five, it says, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. As a former school teacher, I remember teaching a subject um, on synonyms and antonyms. And I think I'll pause for a minute, and I want to ask some of these scholars over here, do you remember what synonyms are? Some of you should be learning that now, probably. What synonyms are? You don't, I'm not going to put you on the spot. Just a yes or no. It's good. Synonyms are, are different words that share similar meanings. For example, happy is to glad, as dark is to dim, or damage is to ruin, ruin or to repair is to fix. So, and antonyms are different words for, with, with opposite meanings. For example, up is to what? Come on, help me out. Over is to, and light is to dark as day is to, come on. This is so easy, guys. We, we have achievers in this room, so I know everybody's going to pass. But I like the concept of, of antonyms because it was first demonstrated in Genesis, the first chapter, 3 through 4, verses 3 through 4, as we've read. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and he divided the light from the darkness. If you sit and think about that for a minute, that's really powerful. And so God divided the light from the darkness, meaning he separated them into two opposing factions. In other words, he disunited them. Likewise, we disunite ourselves with the works of darkness by walking in the light. Romans 13 and 12 says, the night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of what? Darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. So light is good because it represents victorious conduct, safety, peace, life, and purpose. Darkness on the opposing end represents moral depravity, um, trouble, affliction, death, and nothingness. So clearly we see darkness was put into its place. God could have eradicated darkness, but instead he permitted its existence, if you will. In fact, he used it to create day one. And all subsequent days would be inclusive of darkness and light. All subsequent days. Wow. 
That's pretty heavy. There will be 12 hours of day and 12 hours of night to make for a 24-hour day. John, the 11th chapter in the ninth verse, makes reference to this. As it reads, are there not 12 hours in a day? It further reads, if any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not, because he seeth the light in this world. And verse 10 reads, but if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there's no light in him. Wow. So we don't live in darkness. Neither do we live for darkness. We don't sit in darkness, and certainly we don't rest in darkness. But we walk through darkness, carrying the light of Jesus Christ in our heart which assures us the experience of daybreak. Wow. Just look to somebody and just tell them, are you encouraged to walk in the light? Just softly tell them, because it's early still. (laughs) I want to share this verse with you, Ecclesiastes 3. It says that there is a time for every moment. Wow. A time to plant. And then there's a time to pluck up that which was planted. There's a time to kill, a time to heal. There's a time to break down, and then a time to build up. We're talking about those antonyms. There's a time to weep, and then there's a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn, and a time to dance. There's a time to cast away stones, And then there's a time to gather the stones together, a time to embrace. And then there's a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to get and then a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to rend. And then there's a time to sow, a time to keep silence. And then there's a time to speak. There's a time to love, and then there's a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. And then if you skip down to verse 11, it says that he hath made everything beautiful in his time. Wow. So we went through all of these antonyms, and all of them are beautiful in his time. Wow, that's heavy. So tell your neighbor one more thing. I want you to tell them that time belongs to God. Wow. This, it is trademarked by God. He is in control of everything that happens in time and eternity. You may not always like it, but certainly he's in control of everything, and it has its purpose. God shows his authority and dominion over time in Genesis 1 through 5. Now watch this. He did this by naming the two components of time, light and what? And dark. And what did he name light and dark? Day and night. Certainly he has authority to name light and day. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. But on day four, according to Genesis 1 and 14, God spoke into existence two lights, which would be for signs and for seasons, for days and years. But also, they were simply to provide light to the earth. When I was a teacher, one of the courses I taught was science. And two of the modules that we reviewed were concerning the sun and the moon. We discussed that the sun is the only one and true source of light. Wow. It gives light to the moon. The moon doesn't give off its own light. It reflects the light into the earth from the sun. Who think about that a minute. Wow. So right during the darkest hours of the day, we still have what? 
light. And as I relate to this teaching, and this, I'm sorry, as I relate this teaching to our text today, there's one great light, and that great light is the sun. And the sun rules over the day, and the other great light rules over the night. The light is only, the light is only, it's only lesser because it does not emit its own light, but it reflects the light coming from the main source, and the main source is what? The sun. So in studying this text in Genesis, I saw God the Father, who was the main source of light, shining through God the Son, who emits the light of the Holy Spirit into the earth. Isn't that deep? <laughs> Truly, Jesus is the light of the world. He certainly is light in darkness. And that is an encouraging word there is that even though we go through dark times, that we have a light to carry in that darkness. I think it's quite clear at this point that even as believers, we will experience some dark times. Anxiety, stress, physical illness, financial collapse, domestic trouble. I know I'm in this room. Unemployment, social lows, Bullying, and not just in children. Sometimes we have adult bullies. Barrenness, loneliness, imprisonment, molestation, abuse, anger, false accusations, misunderstandings, and the list goes on. I could be here for 20 minutes going on. But we have to walk in authority, even knowing that we have to experience the darkness. Psalms 112 and 4 says, Unto the upright there ariseth light in the darkness. He is gracious and full of compassion, and he is righteous. Yes, we have the light of Jesus that shines through us and shines upon us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. We know that he is with us because you can experience, a, you, you can never experience a shadow unless you have what? Mm. Wow. That's heavy. So that's why we can't walk through a valley and not understand that we have a blessed assurance. Who is Jesus that is with us? According to Thessalonians 5 and 5, you are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. We walk in the light of love. Yes, the light of joy, the light of peace. Wow the light of long-suffering, because we go through things, don't we? The light of kindness and the light of goodness, the light of faith. And some of us feel like we've been brought through darkness only to fade away, but um, it takes us to places where we really don't want to go. Sometimes we sit in depression and loneliness and fear and feelings of rejection. But the key is we should keep walking and keep the light. Walking requires voluntary movement to get from one place to another, to get through the darkness and into the light, to get through the night and into the day. Ephesians 2 and 10 says that we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, that God has before ordained that we should walk in them. Prayer is walking in the light. The effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth what? Much. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17 says, pray without ceasing. Wow. That means pray day and night. Psalm 55 and 17 says, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he shall hear my voice. 
Studying the Bible, the Word of God is walking in the light. 2 Timothy 2 and 15 says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study of the word brings revelation. Often that, that is exactly what we need in a dark moment, a word from God. Psalm 119 and 130 says, the entrance of thy word giveth light. Wow. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Praise also is walking in the light. Psalm 149 and 6 says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth, and a two-edged sword in their hand. A high praise is a praise lifted to God, inclusive of noise from the mouth, while in the midst of trouble. How can you do that? Because you have the strength of the light of Jesus in your heart. Dr. Martin Luther King walked in the light of prayer, didn't he? When he persistently gathered multitudes of people together in the darkest of times, he prayed. He had a plan for peace in his prayers. Yeah, he knew about walking in the light. He was able to make the nation see clearly the difference between darkness and light. Between what is right and what's wrong. What was moral or what was immoral. Dr. Martin Luther King walked in the light. Just tell your neighbor um, that some people do need help with walking in the light. Just whisper it to them. You don't have to tell them loudly. Some people need help with walking in the light. And I'm glad that we've gotten to a place Dr. King knew about walking in the light of the word of God. Your eyes don't get to see the glory of the coming of the Lord if you don't walk in the light of the word of God. Dr. King knew about walking in the light of praise. For with any march, there was singing unto the Lord. And even though these walks were no day in the park, God would yet be lifted up in the darkness. Wow, let's give God a hand. Yes, the authority of the light. Dr. King knew about walking in the authority of the light, who was Jesus Christ. Dr. King's walks were not simply for bodily exercise, but they were unto godliness. His walks were called marches. And a march is, in simple terms, it's a walk with some authority behind it. The young folks want to talk about swag, <laughs> but Dr. King didn't do swag. He did authority. The authority of prayer, the authority of the word of God, and the authority of praise. Thus today, we walk in victory. Every glimpse of light is worth viewing under the shadow of darkness because I have a walk going on. <laughs> I'm moving forward toward an end, a safe place, a tower represented by his name, Jesus. This walk is worth something. Meeting our maker from the soul of the deep, as the cries of children so weak blister the cold night air. This walk is worth something. Every chain's link in the absence of the simplest of drinks and the emptiness of every belly, and the growing of many a woman's womb, fertile only by the oppressor. Yes, this walk was worth it. I knew walking worked. I knew it because we were from there to here. Gradually we crawled, advancing to a walk, promoted to a march, and lifted to a dance, a dance signified by victory. Freedom does ring when you walk. Walk in the light. Let's give God praise. <laughs> Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to share your word of comfort to your wonderful people. Lord, I thank you um, for this occasion because had it not been for this occasion, 
we would not have heard from you that we should be encouraged to walk in the light. We thank you, Lord, for all of the organizers and the planners. And we pray, Lord, that there will be a special blessing upon them, Lord, during this season. And Lord, I ask that uh, the revelation of your word just really becomes real to your people. Those who have come um, did not come just to, to eat the wonderful breakfast or to um, see the children go forth, but certainly for a message inspired by you. And so I pray, Lord, in the coming days, Lord, that you would show your people even more in walking in the light and how to keep a praise on their lips, even in darkness. And that, yes, under every shadow, that there is a light that is to be seen as we look up. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give Pastor Wilson another round of applause for those encouraging words that we must walk in the light of authority. God has given us authority to um, overcome persecution, to overcome bigotry, to overcome all the things that will stop us as a community to go forward. So we want to walk in that light of authority. And Pastor Wilson, thank you for those words of encouragement. We have a special presentation from um, Senator Barbara McCloskey. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but she brings her regrets, but she does say that President Obama and she are committed in ending social inequities in America, and that means paycheck discrimination. Also, fighting for social justice also means ending economic inequality. She wants us to know that she believes in what we do, including our hopes and our dreams, and she wants to call upon us to be drum majors for justice, peace, and righteousness. And this is from, sincerely, Barbara A. Mikelski, United States Senator. We also have another special presentation by our own Dr. Charles Collier, who is our treasurer from the NAACP 70. 7014. He has um, something that he would like to share with us and a giveaway. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Pat. And uh, thank you again, Pastor Wilson, for your uplifting words. Um, I'm Charlie Collier, and uh, uh, I am the uh, co director of the Ira and Mary Zepp Center for Nonviolence and Peace Education as well as a member of the branch. And the other co-director is my wife, Pam Zappardino, who's sitting over there. Many of you know her because uh, she spends more time in Westminster than I do. Um, I'm here to give away a book. And um, uh, Lynn Wheeler, the director of the Carroll County Public Library, is responsible for this gift. Uh, she wanted me to uh, offer it to someone. So as I describe it for a minute, just think about whether you might want to have this and, uh, and read it. The book is called The Children, and it's written by David Halberstam. He's quite a famous American writer. And who are the children? Well, the children were a group of um, young people in Nashville, Tennessee, in uh, the year 1960. And they found themselves together at a point in history where they were fans, they were followers of Dr. King. And uh, these children, who were about 19, 20, 21 years old, they were college students, uh, they became the pioneers of the, the sit-in movement. And in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, they uh, organized a campaign in the spring of 1960 that resulted in the desegregation of downtown Nashville. Uh, it's a great story within the civil rights movement. But those children went on to become freedom riders. And they went on to be on Dr. King's staff in SCLC. 
they uh, founded SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, they include Congressman John Lewis and Bernard Lafayette, the great nonviolence educator, and uh, Jim Bevel and Diane Nash and uh, Rodney Powell, Gloria Powell, and a few others. Um, David Halberstam is a writer that wrote some wonderful books. This one has 88 chapters in it. And those chapters tell many stories of day-to-day -day activities and personalities that were part of the civil rights movement. The Zepp Center took those 88 chapters and gave them titles so that it's easier to find your way around in the book. So I hope that interests you in the book. And if you're interested in learning more about the Zepp Center or about some of the work we do in civil rights history and nonviolence education, either I or Pam Zappardino would be happy to talk with you. Thank you very much. I must add that um, when I got into the work of equity and diversity, um, I met Dr. Zepardino, Zepardino and Dr. Collier one day at Harry's for lunch and asking them to be presenters at our annual um, Education is Multicultural in Esau um, Summer Institute. And they, um, they said yes, and they have been my mentors ever since. So I thank you for that, and I honor you for that. Now, at this time, we will have closing remarks by our wonderful president, Jean Lewis, she worked so hard along with her husband. I don't think they're the dynamic duo. I don't know who's Batman or Robin. I don't know, but I take it from there. Um, and then we'll have um, closing song, We Shall Overcome, and the benediction by uh, Pastor Don Lavroni. Good morning, everyone, and I thank you so much for coming to our 11th uh, Dr. King breakfast. Uh, the committee uh, members that helped put this together, would you please stand? I didn't do it by myself. <laughs> and at this, some of them must be shy because they didn't stand. But at this point, I'd just like all the members of the Carroll County branch of the NAACP to stand that are present. I just want to thank all of you for, uh, for coming this morning. And uh, Pastor Wilson, thank you for your message and how you tied in uh, Dr. King being the light. And would you come forward, please? On behalf of the current... Carroll County branch of the NAACP and our members and officers, I'd like to present two books to you, uh, and I hope that you enjoy them, and thank you so much for coming and, and being agreeable and changing, being flexible. And the young ladies that sang this morning were his daughters. <laughs> thank you so much. You. All the books that you received, excluding the, uh, the children, were given to us by Random House, who is a wonderful, wonderful partner to have. And they gave us those books. Thank you, Lynn, for bringing the, the book, The Children, to us. Uh, the Education Committee, Stan. So I'm missing somebody. She's gone. Oh, OK, she's gone. I, I just, we, we're not sure what they're going to do. But each time, it's better, it's richer, it's it's just a showcase for what the Carroll County youth are doing. We hear, you know, on TV, you just constantly hear negative things about young people. But it's refreshing to see what the Carroll County youth are doing and how well they're being educated in our school systems. And I just thank you ladies for working for that. And Mr. Guffrey, I thank you for what you do for the Board of Education. I don't know how many of you watched the video that was going on while you were eating, but it was two days of the March on Washington, the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington. So Carroll County was represented there, and Dr. Zapperzini did a wonderful 
uh, pre slide presentation for us on that. I'd like to thank the Community Media Center for being here and taping this for us today, and it will air later on Channel 19. We are always soliciting membership to an organization. Doesn't matter what color you are, what country you're from, or whatever, but we're always soliciting membership for our, uh, our branch because as we say, membership is a lifeblood. So a membership is only $30 a year, but you could graduate to uh, subscribing Silver Life for 10 years is $75. There's quite a few of us in here that are either fully paid, uh, members or we're subscribing. We're, we're walking that walk in that light to be part of that membership. AJ Wilson, I'd like to thank you ladies for coming and singing. We enjoy having you every time that you come. You just bless our hearts so much. But I just want to thank everybody for coming out this morning. I know we had a rough week with Carroll County being a picturesque place with the icicles hanging from the trees as we sat in our cold homes. So I just want to thank everyone who got themselves together and came out and remind you that the second, Saturday, second Friday in October is our Freedom Fund Banquet. So put that on your calendars. I think the date is the 12th. But put that on your calendar so that you can be part of us. Get your ads ready together because we need those ads to pay for our events and to stay here in our beautiful office space in the county. So I just want to thank you all this morning for coming and participating. If all hearts and minds are clear, let us stand for the benediction, please. We want to thank Dr. Wilson for that excellent exegesis of the text. Let us look to God to be dismissed. Father God, we thank you for another opportunity to just come and be together as your people. Truly, Lord, it's only because of you that we're here today. And we just say thank you. Thank you for another opportunity to feel the love and understand that we need to begin to walk more in the light. There's enough darkness in this world as it is. So we thank Pastor Wilson for the message that came from your heart. So Lord God, watch over us, protect us, be with us, continue to lead and guide us, and finish the good work that you started in each of us. And we just want to say thank you, Lord. Now may the love of God and the sweet communion of his Holy Spirit continue to rest, rule, and abide with each of us while we're away from one another and together till we pray and meet again. In Jesus' name, amen. It is not an NAACP event if we don't have a song at the end. So we're just going to sing a verse of We Shall Overcome to send us forth out into that light that we've heard so much about this morning. We shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, deep in my heart. Yeah.